what I was going to talk about today is the completion of the catalyst line uh, for APs. And we have been adding uh, slowly but steadily APs, and we've now completed out the uh, the outdoor line, which uh, which has been notably missing. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, I won't dive into them, but we're also uh, thinking very much towards the future right now uh, as we put these radios out. So, of course, one of the big uh, value propositions for Cisco is the wireless stack uh, or the full stack. Uh, implemented from the very edge all the way up to the core of the network. Uh, DNAC has been uh, absolutely amazing and is getting better all the time with its analytics capabilities and, of course, DNA spaces for location. So all of this is uh, is included in the the uh, new Catalyst 9124. Some of the other APs um, that we're not talking as much about today, we added the 9105 series, which uh, came just in time for serious teleworkers uh, environments, but also replaces that wall plate uh, form factor with the switch. Uh, so we've got the 9105. We've also got the 9115 built for medium size uh, deployments. 9120 series featuring the RFASIC, uh, first of the heavy lifters, and just like the 2800 expect, it's the real workhorse. And then the uh, the Cisco RFASIC. All of these have Bluetooth 5, uh, IoT ready, and Wi-Fi 6 certified. Uh, added to that now is the the crown now of the outdoor line, the 9124AX series. Uh, and entering into the market space is 802.11AX with full MU MIMO support of DMA. Uh, we're talking 4x4 plus 4x4 times 4. Uh, on the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz interfaces. Uh, again, Cisco RFASIC trying to keep a common theme there, IoT ready. Uh, the support for 2.5 gig M gig um, is there, also supporting SFP and 1 gigabit fiber, uh, 1 gigabit PoE out. Uh, PoE in, we can support it on 802.38F, AT, and BT. Uh, and then DC power options, 24 to 56 volts. Transmit power on this is back up to 30 dBm, which uh, is the same as the 1572 was, uh, and actually better than the 1560. And of course, centralized management, flex connect, flex bridge, mesh, and EWC are going to be added. So getting down to the hardware features, um, again, it's Two four by four by four spatial streams on 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, it is going to support fully downlink and uplink OFDMA, and there's always uh, a question of how many are used uh, when you say OFDMA. Um, this one's going to be, and we haven't tested it out yet, but this one's targeting uh, equivalent to the uh, 9130 uh, level right now with 37 RUs. Uh, 1024 Quorum uh, data rate at Two and a half gigabits per second. Uh, so it does require the M gig port if you're going to fully load it. Built in IoT radio does support BLE 5.0. It's an SDR radio. Uh, so it supports more than just BLE. Uh, and with Dockers, uh, you can actually put partner solutions on board and utilize that. Uplink options uh, one 2.5 gigabit uh, M gig port. And then we've got two uh, familiar SFPs, both. Uh, um, well, I've got a slide on that, so we'll give you the part numbers for those. Uh, but fiber SFPs. POEN, 8023ATAF is the minimum, BT and Cisco UPOE, local power, uh, DC 24 to 56. Right now, we're releasing the I into D SKUs, uh, and the omnidirectional and directional antenna should be familiar. Um, got some slides covering that as well. But the ESKU is going to be along, I think, late summer, early fall. It's being scheduled for release, and that's when all of the uh, mesh features are coming out as well. Uh, but it's going to have six N-type connectors, um, three ports that are self-identifying antennas, so we are continuing SIA through the outdoor line. Uh, enhanced surge and, and, e and lightning protection built into it, and again, 30 dBm. This will be the first Catalyst AP that is not supported on AirOS uh, controllers. So this is strictly going to be an iOS XE play, uh, and then EWC, of course, is being embedded along with the mesh features. Now, I mentioned a couple of times the Cisco RFASIC, which um, to me 
coming from Cognio and and working through spectrum analysis, I just can't imagine not having spectrum analysis anywhere or the the power uh, of clean air. Cisco RFASIC it gives me a lot more than that, and in fact, we're using it in some interesting ways in the 9124 uh, as we release it. But it does give me clean air, off-channel RRM, now on-channel NDP, uh, dual filter DFS, uh, which gives us excellent DFS uh, false rejection, uh, does support fast locate, adaptive wireless IPS, and WIDS and road detection, all off-channel and out of band. DNA, Cisco's DNA center support uh, for eye capture, um, we've still got passive and on-demand packet capture built into it. Real-time client and AP statistics through telemetry, uh, live-time client location tracking, uh, and then on-demand spectrum analysis through Assurance's ICAP uh, spectrum views, which I think is going to be more important. Uh, and I'm getting getting curious to see what we're going to see when we start adding six gigahertz into the bands because there's a uh, a lot of a lot of questions around that right now with uh, with the legacy holders out there. Um, weight wise and and size wise, this may look like it's almost as big as a fifteen seventy two, but it's half the depth, uh, and actually it's half the weight as well. The fifteen seventy two comes in right around six point one kilograms, uh, and this the E model, the heaviest, comes in at about three and a half kilograms. So it's a lighter. Uh, and smaller, more compact, it's a little wider, but more compact uh, outdoor AP than the 1572 was. And I don't know how many of you hauled a 1572 to the top of a pole, but I've done a couple. And uh, boy, you want to do those one at a time, that's for sure. Ports that are available. We've got on the I model and D models, we're going to have the SFP WAN port, uh, which there we are with the uh, short and long. Um, single mode and, and multi mode fiber SFPs, uh, but we have an SFP port. We've also got the PoE in, uh, PoE out, uh, and then an LED on the front. The 9124AXE, uh, of course, has six N type antenna adapters, uh, and that is designated because there is going to be um, a split dual five gigahertz mode for uh, for support for daisy chaining. Uh, so that's targeted for later this fall as well. But SFP WAN, PoE in, PoE out, and then three SIA antenna ports, and I believe that's one, three, and five that support SIA. So one of each one of the pairs of antennas uh, is SIA capable, and there's a lot of configurability in how we're going to use the antennas uh, built into it. Environmental and antenna types. Uh, Right now, we're holding with minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. I keep hearing uh, internally, my engineering guys say reduced operations up to 50. Uh, we're still rating it at minus 40 um, or plus, uh, plus 40 degrees C. Uh, 55 degrees C with solar loading um, is about as high as you want to go. That 65 is where reduced operations starts to take effect. Uh, and then operating humidity, operating altitude, uh, a lot of the things that are only important if you're going to be going into some of those extreme environments, which a lot of these do. Uh, omnidirectional internal antennas, 6 dBi gain max. Directional antennas are getting to 8 to 10 dBi. Uh, the externals, we can support up to 13 and 14 dBi uh, on 5 gigahertz. And then the IoT is consistent at 6 just a look at some of the antenna patterns. Uh, this is the, the omnidirectional, and note that the IoT is on its own, very own antenna, so I don't have to share anything. Same with the directional, comes out on the five gigahertz to be right at about 60 degrees uh, for an antenna aperture, so not a lot of difference from previous D models, uh, so it should be suitable for replacement. IoT again on its own antenna. Transmit power pass, 30 dBm, 29 dBm for the ESKU. And I'm not sure why we why we lose 1 dBm, but it's a little more complicated routing to across all the antennas. I'm wondering if that's where I lost some power. PoE and what I can run with different PoE uh, power. Uh, I, I showed this slide the other day and somebody popped right up and they were like, what's the point of supporting 802.3 AF if you can't turn on any of the radios? Uh, and this goes back to uh, folks that are staging, right? 
Uh, it's it's kind of hard to justify higher end power or PoE ports uh, if really all you need to do is is bring up the AP and and set some config commands before you ship it out the door. So that's really what that's there for. Um, anywhere else, uh, AT power buys you more uh, PoE out uh, and and one gig support on the M gig uplink. Uh, but BTU, PoE, DC, uh, all of those are required to give you the, the highest performance. Mesh feature support. Uh, I mentioned this is coming. It's actually slated for release 17.6. Uh, right now, this has been released on version 17.5 of iOS XE. Uh, and we do plan to support uh, an AP device pack. That'll make this viable on 17.3 iOS XE platforms. Um, it is manageable by Prime with the C9800 as the controller. Uh, unfortunately, C9124 with EWC is not going to be compatible or backwardly compatible with Cisco Prime. So it's going to take a 9800 controller. Uh, support for DNAC and automation and assurance is coming with, uh, with the mesh versions of those. And they are on the roadmap for... I believe it's later on this fall. EWC mobile app for day zero and day one uh, configuration and support for DNAC on-prem uh, are also provided. Mesh modes, wrap and map, ethernet bridge, daisy chaining bridge, and flex bridge modes um, should cover pretty much all the use cases that you're used to. Support for interoperability. Um, we haven't announced interoperability with indoor APs yet, but I do expect that. Um, so right now we're waiting for that determination uh, with a few other things that are going on in models. Uh, but it will support intermeshing with uh, any of the existing mesh products that, uh, that are still uh, in the product line today. So one thing that did change, and if uh, the entire audience is U.S.-based, it probably doesn't uh, impact you much, but around the world, there's a lot of different regulatory tangles, uh, and we support right now 16 regulatory domains. This AP is the first AP that's going out the door with something called ROW, or what we call the uh, rest of world skew. And in 2.4 gigahertz, uh, you can bring up 2.4 gigahertz just about anywhere in the world with, uh, with very similar restrictions. So we can get a common denominator for 2.4 that regardless of where we ship it, we can at least enable that radio. Uh, what the ROW domain does is it reduces those seven uh, domains and puts us into uh, just the, the seven plus the ROW domain. So it reduces quite a few of the domains down to a single SKU. Um, and then you make country assignments, uh, which is really the, the difference. Typically, you find the same regulatory domain, but there's country additions that restrict that further for, for local operating conditions. And that's where the localization comes in. Uh, that now has a process first time it logs onto the controller to assign this, and we can do that through the profiles and tags that we create. Uh, so you can pre-configure this and actually send it out the door and when it plugs in and calls home the first time, it'll configure itself and produce the right power tables, reboot and come up as that AP version. Um, so this is not the UX AP uh, version two, which some of you may remember uh, localizing using the smartphone. Um, for whatever reason, that didn't take off, uh, but now we've got an alternative for that, which is gonna ship up uh, or shape up a lot of logistics around the world. The other thing that I mentioned uh, was the RFASIC and using on-channel NDP. Well, the challenge changed with the 9124 outdoors. We've been using the RFASIC to perform all off-channel metrics, i.e. Uh, passive listening, NDP transmit, NDP receive, uh, anything that we're doing as far as uh, containment or anything else is all being offloaded to the RFASIC. We get outdoors with a 30 dBm power uh, on the external serving um, interfaces, uh, it starts to really challenge the RFASIC, which I don't know if you guys have ever seen one, but that's, and I hope that's in focus, that is the, uh, the RFASIC card that goes into the Catalyst line of APs now and also into the 9124. 
And just for a little bit of history, that got smaller. That's the one that was in the uh, the 4800. So if you take a look, the size reduction is, is extreme, but the technology went way up in this little guy. One of the things it doesn't have is 30 dBms of power to uh, pump through splitters and everything else and still make 30 uh, dBm EIRP. So we started taking a look at that. Some other things that factored into the decision is we're starting to think real hard about the next 1200 megahertz, which is the uh, the 6E domain. Um, so looking at this, the distances, the the number of neighbors that we expect to have, it started to add up that it was time to start thinking about NDP in a different way. And we came up with a really cool plan to do something called on-channel NDP. Now, neighbor discovery protocol is a Cisco um, solution that pretty much gives me and has given me forever. And you guys know I love RRM and RF. Uh, but I can see every single AP on my network, how they see each other. Uh, and I've got a really full RF picture uh, within the RRM's database uh, of over-the-air metrics, uh, all very much uh, comparable. So that's been something that that I've used for years to troubleshoot problems remotely and also uh, provides us with really good uh, avoidance and, and interference rejection uh, because the algorithm just works. The challenge is how do I continue doing that even with more spectrum to scan? That means more spectrum to listen to. Uh, that NDP right now in shipping product has always been traditionally has to visit every channel and send and receive an NDP uh, on every channel uh, within three minutes. So in FCC right now, uh, typically that means if it was off channel, I was going off channel every 7.2 seconds. On channel NDP is a different thing. I don't have to interrupt client traffic. Uh, I just need to fit in one packet, that one NDP packet to send on the one channel that I'm using. Uh, every 450 milliseconds, I can do that without really significantly impacting utilization on that interface. If I do that and I use the RFASIC, which is scanning in a dedicated fashion, running through all those channels, I can sit for 925 milliseconds on a dwell in 5 gigahertz. Uh, and I can go to 1130 milliseconds on 2.4 gigahertz. The upshot of this whole thing is not only do I get great resolution, I can lock it up in 46 seconds across both bands. So that gives me extremely good uh, and fast convergence times in, uh, in outdoor environments uh, where things could change and do change. Of course, this is not legacy, and we do recognize that we're going to be running up against uh, other APs that don't support it yet. The criteria here is really RFASIC, uh, and we actually look at this coming into the indoor product as well. But right now, it's being limited in the 9124. Uh, WLC can choose this in auto mode. It can look and actually see if there is an RFASIC on board the AP and what its neighbors are, are likely to be. Off-channel uh, is going to be legacy off-channel NDP. Now, if there's an RFASIC on board and I select just legacy mode, uh, the RFASIC, if it's an indoor AP, is still going to be doing all the NDP, and the outdoor one is going to operate in a compatibility mode where it can support a neighbor that's, that's also expecting to see NDP on multiple channels. It's just going to be at a slightly lower power level than the serving radios. Um, and in reality, that really shouldn't bother me much. Mounting kits. One of the things that we're kind of proud of is on the indoor ones, I haven't changed a bracket, uh, say, in 13 years. Uh, and we've been really proud of that because, uh, well, everybody here has hung an AP before. You know that the uh, the longer part of this can actually be mounting the bracket. But if all you got to do is go swap brackets, it can go pretty quickly. So we did design it to reuse uh, any of the 1562's brackets. Uh, this is a, a full list of the brackets that are available for the 9124, uh, and this is a picture of some of them, and yes, we do have an articulated mount. So there's a horizontal, a vertical, and an articulated being uh, being released. Yeah, I was actually really kind of curious on, on how you guys were doing that NDP. That, that's, that's interesting. Um, so... On the on the on the six gigahertz spectrum, you <laughs> still ex you still expect to be able to do that in forty six seconds or not? No, that's a whole different animal. Um, I thought so. 
I can tell you, six gigahertz, somebody asked me what's happening in six gigahertz uh, the other day, and they wondered, are we getting an update? And it's like, boy, if they'd hold still long enough, I'd give you an update. But almost as soon as I put it on a slide, it's changed in the next day. The regulatory activity has been intense, uh, and we're really diving into AFC right now. Some really interesting solutions on 6E because everybody has that scan problem, right? Uh, and knowing where to go. The first models that are coming out are likely to be co-located. Um, we expect that use of multi-BSS uh, broadcast is going to become a big thing. We're talking with infrastructure partners, the client partners right now, uh, about innovative ways to identify co-located 6 gigahertz resources. Uh, but that 1200 megahertz to brute force scan that is probably out for everybody. Um, yeah, that's that's, that's kind of what I thought, but I, I wanted to be, because you did bring it up here, I wanted to be absolutely certain that I, I understood correctly. Thank you. Well, for neighbors, it, it's probably out, but it doesn't mean that I don't have to still go scan that spectrum if I'm right, using right. portions of it. But I think what you're going to find is is uh, optimized uh, for location and the frequencies that I'm more more interested in or the frequencies that my network's actually utilizing uh, to ensure that that we're operating trouble free. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. And you said these do support uh, FRA, or like the indoor APs, or they do not support FRA? No, they do not support FRA, um, and for good reasons, uh, because it, it's outdoor and ostensibly you engineered its solution and know what you're doing uh, in, in that location. FRA could probably break it. Um, it, we are going to support on the E model, we are going to support a version of dual five gigahertz. Uh, and the intent for that is, of course, one up link and one serving five gigahertz, um, which gives you that daisy chain, which used to actually take two APs out on a pole and, and really improves the, uh, the end user throughput. So that's that's the intent for that. No FRA though. I, I don't really play in this world. I work in the tower world more, but we do like, you know, we'll use, we use GPS sync for like frequency coordination on, you know, LTE towers and things like that. So I'm just curious, you know, in, in doing that in commercial RF, do you see an application for that, you know, in outdoor Wi-Fi deployments as well for that kind of coordination? Oh, absolutely. And that is all the buzz right now too about how to provide accurate information and what the AFC is going to require. And six gigahertz, we're going to have to uh, specifically do very accurate location and height above ground for the antennas and everything else. So yeah, there's a lot of lot of conversation right now about all the cool and of course, you know, engineers are engineers. Every time they go looking for a chipset, they come back and it's like, look, I can get temperature and humidity for free too, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're learning the cost of this painfully in CBRS right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You got a little accuracy drift on anything yet? <laughs> yeah, we had uh we had a naval uh yeah, when a couple weeks ago, we had a naval station uh drift in at 400 miles away. Really? Yep. yep. Oops. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> and they didn't trigger your sensors and shut you down? <laughs> uh Google did. Nice. <laughs> Since they're coordinating the spectrum. Yeah, absolutely. Right. There you go. Well, you know, as long as nobody got interfered with, that's probably best. 